Welcome, everyone. I'm a great believer in being prompt for the prompt people. So if someone comes in late, that's, we, we won't glare at them. But those of you who are here, welcome, especially. Um, this is the North Chapel of the Unitarian Society of Woodstock. And we thank them for this has been a very hospitable home for many years for the poetry programs at Bookstock. Um, and something that I noticed yesterday, some people chose to just spend the afternoon. So if you choose to do that, this is a, you've probably noticed already it's a little bit cooler than some places you might be. Um, I neglected to mention I'm Jim Schley, uh, the longtime host of poetry for Bookstock and also co-founder of the festival, Partridge Boswell, had an opportunity to go to Ireland for the summer. So I'm the pinch hitter. And I'd like to acknowledge him, though, because he's largely planned the program. Please silence your cell phones, anything that might give us a barbaric yawp in the midst of an inopportune moment. Uh, the restrooms, there's one straight through that door. There's another one right back here and two more downstairs. Uh, no food or drink, please, uh, except water. And the last thing I'll mention is that uh, we're going to do about 40 minutes in this session. Carolyn is going to do some reading and speaking and also would be happy for questions. But in order for the rest of the day to work for her and for this venue, we're going to really firmly stop at um, 10 after 12. So I'll be the traffic cop slash first grade teacher and, um, and do that job. In addition, I think you all realize, but let me underscore that there's another opportunity to hear her read this afternoon. At 1 o'clock, we'll have Jody Gladding, 2 o'clock, Ocean Vuong, 3 o'clock, Ilya Kaminsky, and 4 o'clock, Carolyn Forche. So it's a feast. And, and again, I welcome you. I'll give a more ample introduction this afternoon for Carolyn's reading. But let me set the stage for her talk this morning by noting that she's the author of four uniquely majestic books of poems, Gathering the Tribes, 1976, The Country Between Us, 1981, The Angel of History, 1994, and Blue Hour, 2003. Her next collection of poems, In the Lateness of the World, will be published in 2020. Time, time is an essential ingredient in these books. Time for gestation, time for concentration and distillation and the time that surrounds us, the times in which we live. Along the way, she has also produced two monumental anthologies of writings by others, Against Forgetting, 20th Century Poetry of Witness in 1993, and Poetry of Witness, the Tradition in English, 1500 to 2001. This spring, she published a memoir entitled What You Have Heard is True, specifically reflecting her experiences in El Salvador in the late 1970s and early 1980s, a book that, for a complexity of reasons she'll talk about, took decades to write. Let me offer a piece of an essay that Carolyn Forche contributed to a beautiful and ruminative book co-edited by Ilya Kaminsky, who will be here with us this afternoon. The book is called God in the House, Poets Talk About Faith. And this is Carolyn. At the end of my poem, The Visitor, there is the line, there is nothing one man will not do to another. It's a truth that I recognized in great pain and horror, but once you know the truth, it's possible to also know that there is nothing one man will not give another to. It gives me great hope and great faith that it's possible to understand this in a single human lifetime. If we live long enough, if we are given enough time on earth, we can live to see the spiritual potential of human beings. What else do we need? Please welcome Carolyn Forche. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so this session is, I'm gonna devote to the memoir and later this afternoon to the poetry. I, I'm moving and walking funny because I fell down a staircase two months ago. So I'm fine, I just, I, I'm not usually like this. And I'm very happy to be here. I've spent a lot of time in, in this town and 
Um, Chuck Fenton in the audience used to have a gallery here in Woodstock and we when uh, my husband and I were, worked on a book of photographs about El Salvador years and years ago, Chuck gave us a show at that gallery and we did a big event there. And he's here today. It was really delightful to see him. Um, this book took uh, 23 years to begin writing and 15 years to write after that. It's been called a very timely book, um, which is an accident of fate of history and of my own uh, various incapacities and, and difficulties moving from poetry to long form prose, writing a memoir. Uh, it's a memoir, it's called a memoir, but it's not about me. There's a main character in it who's not me and um, I don't triumph over adversity in this book and I don't have um, from the triumph over adversity uh, wisdom to share. Uh, other things happen in this memoir that don't have to do with that. It's timely in the sense that it, it tells the story of the, be of the beginning, one of the beginnings, of why the refugees are coming to our border from El Salvador specifically. So I've tried to use my moment in um, the public eye with the publication of this book you know, to make sure people are atten paying attention to that and why it happened and why it continues to happen. The book begins with an epi epigraph by Manlio Argueta, who is the, a great Salvadoran uh, novelist. And this is for you because we, we need to talk about hope a lot these days, it seems, because we easily lose it. Hope also nourishes us, not the hope of fools. The other kind, hope, when everything is clear, awareness. So it, it begins the book. I was 27 years old. I was teaching at San Diego State University, where, by the way, Ilya Kaminsky also used to teach. Um, and I was, um, I had spent the summer in Spain with the poet Clarivel Alegria. I was translating her. And it was my first translation. I was very young. I thought, you know, all I had to do was buy a fat Spanish-English dictionary and I could sit and translate. And I discovered that Clarivel Alegria had a history that I was very unaware of. She grew up in El Salvador. She was born in Nicaragua. Her poems reflected that history, which was 50 years of military dictatorship and everything that goes with that. So I didn't understand her poems well enough to translate them. I couldn't distinguish when she was speaking metaphorically and when she was speaking literally. So I went to stay with her for a few months and there I learned a great deal more about Central America. And I came back depressed and wanting to do something other than or besides or in addition to teaching freshman composition in a university, and I didn't know what. I joined Amnesty International and I began writing letters for Amnesty International. You know, dear esteemed dictator, please release your tortured prisoners, gratefully yours, Carolyn, like that. We actually had to write nice letters. Amnesty didn't let us insult them. So I was doing that and I had all these papers on my table and I was grading papers and I was writing these letters and I had these urgent action reports and I was home alone and my roommate was away. We don't remember why. And I heard a vehicle in my driveway. And I wasn't expecting anyone. I'm the eldest of seven children. We were taught not to open the door to strangers. I was going to pretend not to be at home, but I was really curious and I looked out the window and I could see that this vehicle was a dust covered sort of early SUV and it had El Salvador license plates. I had heard nothing but horror stories about El Salvador. And here was an El Salvador vehicle in my driveway. Then a man got out with a big bag stuffed with papers over his arm, and then two little girls jumped out. And I relaxed because I thought, well, he can't be an ax murderer. He's traveling with two little girls. That He came to the front porch. They rang the doorbell. They rang it again. I thought about hiding. And then I, my curiosity got me and I opened the door with the chain on and the man said, you are Carolyn Forche. 
and I am Leonel Gomez Vidas, and these are my daughters, and we have driven from El Salvador to visit you. I have to talk to you. So I showed him, I asked him to wait. I went and got a photograph I had taken in Spain and asked him to identify the people in the photograph because if he was, I'd heard this name in Spain. Leonel Gomez Vidas was Clarivel Alegria's cousin. So if so, he would be able to identify her in a picture. And he did, and he laughed at me. He said, that was very good that you checked me out like that. I like that. And I opened the door, and he came in and started bossing me around. Get this stuff off the table. We have work to do. Can you make some coffee? You know, things like that. And I was a, a young feminist, and I didn't want to be told to get things off the table or make coffee. But he spent three days with me, and he talked and talked and talked and talked beginning with the conquest of the Americas way back in history and the cultivation of indigo and cotton and then finally the cultivation of coffee. And by the end, he's drawing American gunships flying over the mountains of El Salvador and little American flag embassy and three to five years we're going to be at war and what your country decides to do is going to determine the fate of hundreds of thousands of people. So his proposal was, and I know this will sound as odd to you, it sounded odd to me, he said, I want to invite you to come to El Salvador because you are a poet. And I want a poet to see this from the beginning because then when the war starts, the poet can come back to the United States and speak to the American people about the reasons for the war. So I talked to him about how Americans view poets. <laughs> and yeah, that, exactly. I won't go into it or waste time, but I told him what you would imagine I would tell him. And he said, oh, that's too bad. Is that really? I, he said, that's terrible. He said, you'll have to change that. <laughs> so I thought the man is crazy. He's crazy. And he said, no, because I said, you want a journalist? He said, no, I don't want a journalist. And I asked him why, and he said, because journalists, they believe in objectivity. And he said, I want a poet because they have more powerful language, and they see the world in weird ways. And they don't have preconceived notions, and they don't try to. And it's not just a matter of the facts. He said, I want somebody to feel this place. So that was the invitation. He said, don't worry. You can stay with women, friends of mine. I will show you the whole country. I don't ask you anything of you, except someday maybe you will write about it or talk about it. And then he drove away with the little Andean flute music floating out of the vehicle. And he says, I'll see you in January. And I said, I yelled in the middle of the street. I didn't say I was coming. And then I asked everyone I knew whether this invitation I should accept. And Everyone I knew who also then knew me said, no, no, no. This is not what you should do on your Guggenheim grant. You are going to get malaria or worse. You're going to get killed. You don't even know this guy. And even Clarivel Alegria said she doesn't really know very much about him. And he, she always portrayed him as a mysterious man. She didn't really want to talk about him. But when they did talk about him, they said, well, he he has this little coffee farm, but he gave some land away to the campesinos. He sleeps on the ground with his, his motorcycle in his arm, arms in the night, and he races motorcycles. He's a champion marksman, and he might be a guerrilla commander or might work with the guerrillas, but he also might be with the CIA. <laughs> Nobody knows for sure who he is, and, he's, and, he's, and the husband said to me, her husband said, and he is very, it's dangerous game what he is involved with. So I'm 27, this was intriguing to me. I, you know, this was not a, this was not a cautionary uh, description. This was more, hmm, you know. So I asked and asked and asked and everyone said no. And finally a, a man I had gone to college with came through, we had coffee and he said, I think you want to go. You're going to ask people until someone agrees that this is a good idea. So he said, let me be that person. Go. And I said, really? And I made my reservation. So I get to um, Elopango Airport, which is now just, again, a military airport. It was an old, decrepit airport. With, it was dark. 
I landed, they went through all my things, there were soldiers all over the airport. I was the only foreigner on the plane, everyone else had disappeared and no one was there. Leonel was not there to meet me. So that was the first and maybe the first of hundreds of times when I thought maybe this wasn't a good idea, maybe I should go home. Then a Peace Corps volunteer came through the parking lot and said, you must be Carolyn Forche. I'm John Taylor, Peace Corps. Leonel sent me to pick you up. I was, oh, okay. So I went with the American, and while we were driving toward Benihana of Tokyo, which is where we, um, he, I said, he said, how long have you known Leonel? And so I, I said, um, three days? And he said, so, you don't know him very well either then. And I thought, either? He said, he's a pretty strange guy. And then he said, and I've had some really interesting experiences with him, sometimes too interesting. So that was the beginning. Now, I'm going to begin with a kind of harrowing passage, which is the opening passage. After this passage, I'm going to read to you, um, then the doorbell rings. You know, and I start the story from the beginning. He's funny, he's brilliant, he's maddening. I was young, I thought he was bulletproof. I thought nothing was gonna happen to us. I thought that I was just going to have my American passport and learn something and expand my cultural horizons and perfect my Spanish. And I didn't understand that not only was war coming, but already it was the time of the death squads. So it was a very brutal time in El Salvador. It was almost more brutal than after the thing got organized and the war started. So it is near the end now. We are walking in the rippling heat of a sorghum field, cicadas whirring to an empty sky. A man uncorks a water gourd. Another man leans against a spade. There is a woman here, too, wearing an aproned skirt over her trousers. Hard light and the dry rattle of sorghum seed heads. I'm holding a spray of seeds. One of the men takes Leonel aside and tells him something, a secret, like everything else. We get into the Jeep and without explanation drive to another place not far from this field. The campesinos, rural peasants, would have walked, measuring distance not in kilometers but in hours or days. What are we looking for, I ask, and as always he doesn't answer, swearing under his breath through the haze of smoke that hangs in the air where the corn had been growing. We stop near a cluster of champas shacks made of mud and wattle. One of them has collapsed and smoke rises from it. Wait here, he tells me, but I don't wait. I had stopped waiting for him months before this, but he can't seem to break this habit of telling me to wait. Smoke is rolling like a shore cloud along the fields just above the blackened stubble. We walk and when he stops, I stop. And when he, when he continues, I continue. He palms the air to say, slow down, or be quiet. I slow down and am quiet. When we reach the champas, no one is in them. No one is home. A large plastic bowl used for making the slurry that becomes tortilla dough is overturned on the ground. There is a child's t-shirt in the tortilla slurry. Behind one of the champas, it appears that several hens have been held by their feet and whacked against a stone. They are lying on the ground, one of them still opening and closing its beak. A hundred or so or so meters more, and we hear the whine of flies, the hissing and belching of turkey vultures, the flapping of wings like applause in the maize stalks as the fattened birds try to lift themselves. A flatbed truck follows at a distance behind us with three campesinos standing in the back. They are calling out to us or to the driver of the truck, but I don't understand what they say. I don't know what I had expected to see, but not the swollen torso of a man with one arm attached to him, a black pool of tar over his crotch. I didn't expect that his head would be some would be by itself some distance away without eyes or lips. The stench in the air is familiar, a rotting, sweet, sickening smell. 
human death. I bend down when I see the head, but I hear Lionel saying, don't touch it, let the others do it. At first I thought they were going to find the rest of the man and place his remains in the truck, but instead they gather the arms and hands, the legs with their feet attached, and bring them to the torso where it lies on the ground. They set the head on the neck where it once had been. Then the three men take off their straw hats and stand in a circle around the man they have reassembled. They stand and one crosses himself lightly. The parts are not quite touching. There is soil between them, especially the head and the rest. Birds nearby hoping we will go away and leave them to this meal. The air hums. We walk. Why doesn't anyone do something, I think I asked. On this day, I will learn that the human head weighs about two and a half kilos. And it just begins with, over the years, I've asked myself what would have happened if I hadn't answered the door that morning, if I'd hidden until the stranger was gone. The book has a narrative that just goes like a novel except there are passages that I took out of my um, notebooks of the time. The language is different in them. It's fast and rushed, and I decided to have these passages in the book because they replicate the state of mind, um, which is different than the calm narration, a different sort of state of mind. Monsignor Romero, the, uh, Saint Romero now, um, is, in, is a character in the book. I knew him. He, he's the one who got me out of El Salvador on March 16, 1980. There are lots of wonderful characters in the book. Lionel has a good sense of humor. I hope I captured that, and I hope I captured the kind of, um, the kind of rapport we had. I'm going to read a little passage from toward the end. I wasn't so always so very good at what I was doing, um, and this illustrates that. I'm going to read you one of my failures. Um, two months later, it was toward the end for me, but I didn't know it. I attended Mass in the Basilica on Sunday, hoping once again to receive communion from Monsignor, to feel the raindrops from his aspergillum land on me, even though I hadn't confessed the years I'd been away from the sacraments, and even though I wasn't convinced that I would remain among the faithful. I took photographs of him at the altar, speaking into what appeared to be a telephone held by an altar boy, whom I would meet decades later as a grown man attending school in the United States. Seated to the left of the altar is Father Ignacio Eocuria, arms folded, not wearing his glasses, his eyes appearing to focus on Monsignor's raised hand. After Mass, some young people from a popular organization asked to meet with me in one of the Basilica's bell towers. They knelt, bandanas around their necks, ready to be pulled up over their faces, and whispered that their compañeros were among those in the coffins lined up at the communion rail to be blessed, their faces visible through the windows cut into the coffin lids. I had gone close enough to look at the faces, and they resembled photographs of children asleep. Strands of incense smoke still crawled through the gray air, and rock doves flapped their wings in the stone clerestory. As I left, I noticed a man wearing sunglasses who was inexplicably carrying an attache case, which is maybe why I took note of him. He paused near one of the side altars as if offering a special prayer. The following day, a priest found an attache case containing 72 sticks of dynamite behind that side altar. It had been set to detonate during a funeral mass for a civilian member of the junta scheduled for that afternoon, but the detonator had apparently failed. Later, I saw the man in the sunglasses standing in the lobby of the hotel. I went up to him and said, hello, introduced myself and told him that I had seen him at Mass. You did not see me, he said stiffly, and he excused himself. 
Lionel was skeptical when I told him the story of the man with the attaché case because such a man doesn't usually allow himself to be seen. Describe him again, he said. You have to give me something more than sunglasses. He didn't look Salvadoran. You're telling me what? That he was a gringo? I don't know. Well, you said you spoke with him. Was he a gringo? I think so. You have to do more than think so. You have to be sure. Can we drop it then? I'm not sure. Mira, Papu, guard your credibility. This is something that cannot be recovered once lost. Remember the rumor that flew around about a young girl with a man's head stuffed into her stomach? Remember that? You know they found her that way. I know they found her that way. But it doesn't sound true. So? So you can't say it. You can't write it, even in a poem. If you had a photograph of the goddamn thing, no one would believe you. As for your man in the basilica, your observations are imprecise. Next time, pay closer attention. Someday, you will be talking to your own people, writing for your own people. I promise you that it is going to be difficult to get Americans to believe what is happening here. For one thing, this is outside the realm of their imaginations. For another, it isn't in their interest to believe you. For a third, it is possible that we are not human beings to them. OK, I'm going to stop there. And um, thank you. <laughs> My hands shake not because I'm nervous. It, shakes because I, of my discs. So I would love your questions. And I can talk about the process of the writing of a book that takes 15 years. And I can talk about Salvador. Or I, could, I can talk about the border right now. Anything you want to ask about being a poet and then trying to write prose. Or you can even ask if I write with a pencil or not, since I labeled some of my passages written in pencil. Those are the ones that come from the early notebooks. Yes, sir. Um, because in the beginning, I was at a conference when I was pretty young, after El Salvador. And after El Salvador, I didn't know it, but I was traumatized. I was a little bit not OK, more than probably a little bit. And I was at this conference in Lake Saranac, New York. And Ed E.L. Doctorow was the big fiction writer there. And so I was jabber, jabber, jabber. I was telling people about El Salvador all the time. I must have been so boring. You know, I mean, I would just talk and talk and talk. And he said, I think you should write a novel about all this and call it Gringa. And so I tried. But a fiction, you have to make things up. I found that difficult about this particular situation. I changed my name. I gave myself another profession. And I stopped on page five. Every time I made a new version, I would stop on page five. I couldn't go any further. And then Russell Banks, bless his heart, said to me, don't write a novel. This happened. You have to write it as nonfiction. Well, the war was on. And I said, well, I can't write some of this stuff. Some of what's in here couldn't be written during the war. Some of what's in here wasn't known for a long, some of what's in here wasn't known until I published this. So I couldn't do it, and also I wasn't ready. I wasn't mature enough. I think I was too, I didn't have distance. And, but, but I knew it had, if, and I had promised Monsignor Romero and Lionel that someday I would write about it. And I knew that the seven poems I had published that have to do with it was not that writing, was not fulfilling that promise. I knew this, that I had to do this. And then, you know, I got older, and I thought, you're running out of time, you know? You have to write this. And that's what I started it in 2003. And, uh, and it just took a long time, because I didn't know how to write a, a prose book, and I didn't know how to structure a memoir. And the reason it's called a memoir is because it's nonfiction and it's written in the first person, although I knew it wasn't going to resemble other memoirs. So, but it was the best we could do for a label. 
And um, there were five versions of it, four versions of it. This is the fourth version. The other three I had to put away. Because when you're a, when you're a new memoir writer, you write about your whole life. Everything is in there. You know, you braid everything together, and you don't know where to stop. You know, you, know, you just have too much, and it's not connected. We're not as shapely human beings as we think we are. You know, most of us have lived five or six lives, and you know, we have different time periods and different things. So I had to unbraid it, and, and I realized that this was the story had to be told by itself. There could be little other things, little flashbacks or something in it, but basically I had to tell the story of, of that time, and that would fulfill my obligation, and so that's why I zeroed in on this. And it just took me a long time because I wasn't, I was a poet. So instead of going forward in prose the way prose writers do, you know, they just write and write and write and write, and they get through a whole rough draft, and then they revise it. And what I did was I wrote a sentence, and then I polished the sentence, and then I rewrote the sentence, and then I crossed the sentence out, and then I wrote another sentence and you know this would just take me a long time because I hated going forward until the language was right in the previous sentence and I told Margaret Atwood told me that's not how you write prose <laughs> and she said get through the whole draft and then we can talk about it you don't have a book yet she said until you have a first draft all the way to the end so I took a lot of advice from very smart, good writers. But I also was teaching, and I was a mom, and I got breast cancer, and a lot of things intervened, you know? That was the other reason, 15 years. But then I read a book by Annie Dillard called The Writer's Life, or The Writing Life, and she says in there, most books take about 10 years. And I was, felt better. I thought, well, that's okay then. I'm only five years overdue. It's all right. No, she, they, she said, don't worry about it. It takes what it takes, you know, and other things will happen. And so, yeah. What else? Yes, uh, back. Well, here's what my advice to you. If you can't break the habit of polishing sentences, give yourself small chunks to accomplish. Write paragraphs and keep writing paragraphs. You might have the sentences polished, but break it up into smaller bits and go for it. You know, try. Try to write it like the first draft of a poem and write a lot of them and then lay them all out and see what you have and what kind of order they need to be in and um, what you have not written and what the arc is and all of that. Uh, that's what I suggest. She asked, how do you um, move from polishing sentences as a poet to writing a whole book of prose? That was the question. I was supposed to repeat the questions and I forgot twice now because I don't have a good memory anymore. So asking me to repeat the questions for the people who can't hear so well anymore, you're asking someone who don't, doesn't remember to do that. Yes, uh, Lloyd, Lloyd, did you have your hand up? Lloyd? This is Lloyd Schwartz, a, the great poet. He's in our audience. Uh, <laughs> Well, my husband volunteers on the other side of the border in the shelters, and I'm writing a text for a book of photographs that he has done. He focused on the helpers and rescuers, the people who are actually doing that. I've been to the border quite a lot, but not recently, and um, I even waded across the Rio Grande when it wasn't militarized yet. It was easy. Everybody was crossing back and forth. It was a normal thing to do. The boroughs went back and forth. The people went back and forth. The problem is, people don't, what we're focusing on now, in the past, they were laborers who were coming back and forth to work. 
Now, its whole families leaving forever their villages and, and running away with their kids in their arms in a little rucksack, with facing thousands of miles through the desert with nothing. People don't do that unless what they're running away from is much worse than anything they can imagine in front of them. They just, people don't leave their homes, their grandparents, their everything. El Salvador has a level of violence, Honduras even more so, also Guatemala. These are, these are narco states. These have a level of violence unimaginable by us in mo most of our communities, not all, but um, there's extortion, kidnapping, butchery, torture, murder. They want to save their kids. The kids are actively forced into these gangs. It's not called recruitment. They have to join or something bad happens to their mom, you know? I mean, this is a terrible thing. So they come to our border and they have a, an idea of the United States. Their idea is that we are this wonderful country, you know, to the north. And there they'll be safe. And it will be okay if only they can get to the United States. And now we're not that country. We are in violation of international law. We're in violation of all of our covenants, protocols, and agreements governing treatment of refugees. And we are in another place now. And I think we have to face that we've become something else so that we can start working on not going back to what we were. There was a lot wrong with what we were. But going forward and becoming a humane nation um, and, and solving our, our enormous and historically unprecedented problems. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, were, we worked together. He went into exile um, during the war, came to the United States, knocked on the doors of the Congress until he finally got some Democratic congressmen to listen. He put together the peace negotiation that ended the war. I went back to Salvador for the signing of the peace. This is a funny story. I, I went back and I was sitting at the tr table with the guerrilla commanders, and they were all in suits and ties. Everybody was beautiful breakfast. Nice breakfast. Remember Dan Quayle? He was the representative of the United States at the signing of the peace accords. And the guerrillas were saying, go up and meet him. He's your vice president. We'll take your picture with him. He's your, you know, and you can meet him. And I said, I don't want to meet him. I don't like Dan Quayle. I don't want to go up there. And they said, but it's historic. We'll take your picture. So I went. And Dan Quayle said, oh, are you with the embassy? And I said, no, I'm with the gorillas over here. And he said, I'm from Indiana. And I said, I know. And then they took the picture and I sat back down. He wasn't very bright, you know. He didn't know what to say to me except that he was from Indiana. But Lionel, Lionel and I worked together for a long time. We were friends. He was my mentor all those years. In 2009, I went back and I was invited to the commemoration of the deaths of the Jesuit priests. And Lionel was there. We visited in his casita. John Taylor, who picked me up at the airport, was, happened to be there, and he walked in. We're all together again, 2009, November. And then I came home, and a couple days later, Thanksgiving Eve, I got a call that Lionel had died of heart attacks, many, several heart attacks in the emergency room in San Salvador. So I flew back, and we scattered his ashes on the Wazapa volcano that's in here. And you know, we had to let him go. So I was in touch with him until he died, till just before he died. And the other characters, and some of the other characters in the book survived. And they all had a party when the book, this book was published, and the Peace Corps volunteer carried the signed books down to them. And they had a party without me in San Salvador. And they took a picture. And they were all on the couch, the characters in my book, sitting on the couch with the book in front of them, smiling. And I thought, we're old now. <laughs> we don't, you know, they, they didn't look like, the, you know, the, the dramatically beautiful, you know, young heroic people that I thought saw them as, and now we are all. And I said to Harry, look how old they look. And he said, Forche, look in the mirror. We are the same as they are. <laughs> you know? So anyway, we've only got one minute, and we have to stop because of that. Yes? I was wondering when I first read the Colonel, I was struck by the amazing ability you had to keep a distance from what was going on. You just talked about 
talk about maintaining that distance from horrific well, you know, you, sometimes when you see something horrific, you go into a kind of shock, a kind of weird, numb place. You can't quite believe what's happening. You know, I think that was part of it. And part of it was I was writing, you know, and Anton Chekhov said, be cold. Don't put a heat on this. The harder it gets, the more intense it gets, the more cold, the more flat you should be. And I listened to that because I thought it was important to respect the events and, and sh 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 shear them. This is Vermont. You have sheep. Shear them of, <laughs> of anything that was extraneous to what occurred, you know. But I was a poet, so yeah, I turned the moon into a, a, a ball, light bulb and things like that. You know, I couldn't help myself. But yeah, I did. That's what I think you have to do. So I'm going to give a poetry reading in this room at four, and I really, really recommend that you come to Ocean Vuong and to Ilya Kaminsky before that. Okay? And I'll be around here. Okay. Thank you.